Colossians 4, verse 13 through 14. Paul writes, For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. Philemon verses uh, 21 through 25. It reads, Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, and my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And then 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 10, our last scripture. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. And I want to reread that last portion of scripture again in the New American Standard Bible, um, 2 Timothy 4, chapter 9 through 10. It says, uh, make every effort to come to me soon, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. And just for a few minutes this morning, I want to preach to us about the dangers of misplaced affection, the dangers of of misplaced affection. Would you lay your Bibles down and would you just lift your hands and lift your voice one more time? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, we thank you, Lord God. Have your way in this place today. Praise God, and you may be seated this morning. The tragedy of Demas is one of the saddest stories in Scripture, in my opinion. Demas was a Gentile convert who Paul was likely training and discipling as he had done with many others. Timothy, Silas, Mark, Luke, Titus were some of the many ministers that Scripture says learned under Paul. And Demas seemed to be among them. And these are the only scriptures in the Bible that reference this young preacher, Demas. Paul wrote Colossians and Philemon during his first imprisonment in Rome. During this imprisonment, he lived by himself under house arrest, guarded by a Roman soldier who he was chained to. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 28, and Paul dwelt two years in his own hired house and received all that came into him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding. And so for these two years, while Paul is chained to that Roman guard and those Roman guards were one of several who were rotated in shifts for 24 hours a day, it is during this time that he sends greetings from himself and from Demas to the church at Colossae. And then he sends a private letter to Philemon, who was a convert and a citizen and believer in the city of Colossae. And so this means that during those two years while Paul was in house arrest and Demon, Demas came to visit him. And so he preached with him and he taught with him. He prayed with him. He fasted with him. He baptized people with him. He prayed people through to the Holy Ghost with him. He saw the burden and the passion that Paul had for the lost souls and for ministry because it says that he was declaring Christ even to the guards who were chained to him. And he also wrote letters of encouragement and instruction to different church leaders and churches that make up many of the New Testament that we have today. But in spite of all this, 
Paul wrote to Timothy several years later as his life is coming to an end that Demas had abandoned him. Demas worked under the great apostle Paul who built churches, who trained ministers, who developed leaders. He worked alongside Luke, the physician who wrote the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, as well as Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark and worked as Peter's assistant. I don't know if it was the love of a woman. I don't know if it was a job opportunity that he couldn't pass up. I don't know if it was pressure from his family, but whatever it was, uh, there was something in the world uh, that Demas found attractive. Something in the world caught his attention and it began to pull and to tug. And I'm sure Demas probably spent a season of his life wrestling against this love and this affection from whatever this thing was. And I'd imagine that he would go to church with Paul, but his thoughts would be elsewhere. He would kneel down to pray, but his mind would be wondering, thinking about whatever it was, that thing uh, pulling him away uh, from uh, his relationship with God. And ultimately, whatever that thing was in the world uh, that Demas loved, uh, it led him to walk away from his church, uh, to walk away from his pastor, to walk away from his calling, uh, to abandon his ministry, to forsake his faith uh, and his relationship with God. Uh, and he packed up everything uh, that he owned and he got on a ship uh, and he sailed more than a thousand miles away uh, to chase uh, the thing uh, that he loved. I've come this morning uh, to remind this group uh, of apostolic uh, people at Souls Harbor Church uh, the words of 1 John 2 uh, and 15 uh, where he wrote, Love not the world, uh, neither the things uh, that are in uh, the world. Uh, if there are things uh, in the world that are pulling your time uh, from prayer, uh, they're hindering your ability to fast, uh, your willingness to worship, uh, or your boldness to live, uh, a godly apostolic life, uh, then I'm here to tell you, uh, Demas, uh, you're in danger of misplaced affection. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated. Jesus says in John chapter 10 and 10 uh, that the thief cometh not but to steal uh, and to kill uh, and to destroy uh, and the devil uh, and this world. Uh, they want to steal uh, your soul uh, and they want to kill uh, your anointing uh, and they want to destroy uh, any chance uh, that you may have uh, at salvation. Uh, the world will promise you uh, paradise in a life uh, of sin uh, and lust uh, but that life uh, will only lead you to destruction because of his misplaced affections uh, Demas abandoned Paul uh, and left uh, for Thessalonica because of misplaced affections uh, Lot left the spiritual covering uh, and the blessings of his uncle Abraham uh, because of misplaced affections uh, Samson uh, allowed a woman uh, to cut his hair uh, and lost his strength uh, given by God uh, and died in the house uh, of his enemies uh, because of misplaced affections. Uh, Saul disobeyed uh, the commandments of God uh, to kill uh, the Amalekites. Uh, he was rejected by God, uh, lost his kingdom, uh, and ended up begging uh, an Amalekite man uh, to kill him in the field. Misplaced affections. Uh, Solomon took uh, unto himself uh, 300 wives uh, and 700 concubines uh, for political marriages uh, and built temples uh, to their false gods uh, and worshipped idols uh, and brought the idol worship that plagued uh, Israel for generations uh, until God finally said enough uh, and he gave them uh, into the hands uh, of their enemies. Because of misplaced affections, Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You may think, oh, it's not that bad. 
But I'm telling you that once your heart begins to veer away uh, from God and your heart uh, gets off of God, uh, then the world is going to pull you further and further away from God, uh, further and further away from the church, uh, further and further away uh, from your friends uh, and your family until ultimately you're going to be looking back uh, and wondering, uh, well, where did it go wrong for me? Well, how did I get uh, to this place? Uh, it's because uh, your heart uh, that was so on fire for God uh, became cold uh, towards God uh, and a spark uh, from the world of love uh, or money or opportunity sparked in your heart uh, and it burned and burned until finally the fire of the world consumes you. Romans chapter 8 uh, verses 35 through 39. Sorry, I didn't get these to you before. It says, who shall separate us uh, from the love of Christ? Uh, shall tribulation or distress uh, or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Uh, as it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through him uh, that loved us, uh, for I'm persuaded that neither death, uh, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, uh, nor powers, uh, nor present, nor things to come, nor height, depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus uh, the only thing uh, that Paul didn't say uh, was you uh, because the only thing uh, that can take you out of the love uh, of God uh, the protection uh, of God uh, is you when you remove yourself uh, from his love uh, because of your misplaced affections uh, and chasing the things of this world, uh, I'm going to remind you again, uh, love not this world, uh, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, why don't we lift our hands right now uh, and begin to connect our love with God? <laughs> Brother Alexander, what do I do if this is me? Great question. Thanks for asking. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. That sounds like us. Fake news. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and has been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You got to love the apostolic doctrine. I'm telling you, you won't be caught by fake news. You won't be caught by every wind of doctrine if you just love the apostolic doctrine. Every day, uh, I hold my son uh, and I pray a prayer with him. I say, Shema Israel, Yahweh El Hainu, Yahweh Ahad, Fahavta, et Yahweh Eloheka, Bahalavaka, Ufko Nashika, Ufko Mayotika. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Uh, I quote him, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in the glory. And I quote him, Colossians 2 and 9. For in him, which is Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you know why? My son's only five months old now. But by the time he's five or six or seven or 13, he'll have heard that every day. And when he gets older, the world's going to say, oh, there's no God. The world's also going to tell them, oh, nature's God. They're also going to say the universe is God. Science is God. Oh, every religion leads to the same God and the same eternity. And he can just worship whatever he wants, however he wants, because he'll end up in heaven anyway. But that's not the truth. He's going to know that there is one God. 
He's going to know that his name is Jesus. And he's going to love that God with everything he has, with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all strength. Paul wrote in Titus chapter 1, he says, unto, all, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and consciousness is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. The New American, uh, the New American Standard Bible translates that. It says, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. We need a love for apostolic doctrine. Amen. We need a love for apostolic lifestyle. Somebody say amen. Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12 and 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Can I tell you this morning that God is still calling us to a lifestyle of holiness and a lifestyle of separation and a lifestyle of consecration. He did not call us to confirmation, to mold ourselves into the image and the lifestyles of this world. And this is why as believers and as a church, we must resist the call to cultural relevance. Somebody say amen. Culture is a, it comes from a Latin word called cultura. It's a farming word, right? It has to do with all the factors in the environment that determine what can be grown there. And so my wife and I, we live in Tucson and my son, and Tucson is hot and dry. So if you're going to do major agriculture in Tucson, you have to plant things that will grow well in a hot and dry environment. And so you would say the culture of Tucson is crops like grain or corn or nuts. But when you go to some place like Texas or Arkansas, where it's really humid, you would say they have a culture for rice. And when you go to places like Wyoming, where they have long winters that are cold and dry, you would say they have a culture for vegetables, green leafy vegetables. And the problem with culture is that it changes based on your environment. And so you come into the service and you can be apostolic to the core. One God, I'm a tongue talking, holy rolling, shouting, every, everything. You're, you're apostolic to the core. And today is Sunday and we live it. We believe it. We roll out of this place speaking in tongues. But then you go to work tomorrow and you get into the culture of your work and all of a sudden you can't talk about God you can't lift a prayer for your brother or you get with your friends from high school or your friends from even from the world and and it's a different culture and so you take on that culture that's why Paul said be not conformed but be transformed. Uh, God is not calling me to conform to my workplace. He's calling me to transform my workplace. He's not calling me to conform to my friends and my family. He's calling me to transform my friends and my family. If your love for this world uh, leads you to conform, you'll end up losing everything. That you have been given. Reuben was Israel's firstborn son. And as the firstborn, he had a birthright to a spiritual blessing of Abraham and a double portion of everything that his father had. And so because Israel or Jacob had 12 sons, what they would do is they would take everything that he had and they would divide it into 13. And so Reuben got two, 
and everyone else got one. That, that's how the, the double portion worked when his father passed away. But the Bible says he was disqualified from his promise of blessing and inheritance. And, and on his deathbed, his father tells him, he said, Reuben, you are my might, preeminent in excellence and power. Yet you are unstable as water. You shall not excel. And the thing is, when you read through the entire Old Testament, you know, you go through the judges, you go through the kings. Not one single leader ever comes from the tribe of Reuben, the firstborn, the inheritance. But he's mighty. He's preeminent. In fact, when you look, when you read through the book of Judges, it actually says that Reuben took, they, they, they didn't take a side, right? In, in, in one of the battles, they didn't take a side because they said, oh, well, well, if we fight with Israel and they lose, we'll be in a bad place. If we choose the, to fight with the enemy and, and we lose, or we'll, we'll be in a bad place. So we're just not going to do anything. You know, unstable is water. Think about it. Water takes whatever, the shape of whatever it's in. It, 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 has, it has no shape. You just, you just conformed. And so on the outside, Reuben had everything. But on the inside, he was unstable. He just, he just went where, with his feelings. He was shaped with whatever his emotions had him with. He had no convictions. He had no consecration. He had misplaced affections, and he lost his promise. I'm telling you that God has given you everything uh, that you need. Uh, he has given you his word. Uh, he's given you his spirit. He's given you an amazing pastor and godly leaders. He's given you an anointing and a calling and talents and giftings. You have everything you need to fulfill the will and calling for God on your life. But if you're putting your time and your passions and your effort into the wrong things, you're either going to walk away like Demas or it'll be taken away from you like Reuben. I wonder if my musicians will come as we all stand today. As I'm coming to a close, we, we often think, and, and, and it's, it's kind of to push by this, this the mainstream kind of Christianity that, you know, this, this one saved, always saved. But I want to let you know, Reuben lost his promise. Now, the Bible says in Acts, when Peter came on, on the day of Pentecost, you know, he says, you know, uh, repent, be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. And then he says, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I'm telling you, this promise, it's a gift that is freely given. It's there for you to receive the Holy Ghost, to take on the name of Jesus. But I'm going to tell you something, uh, that if you conform to this world, if you are, are, are t letting your passions uh, take a hold of you and you pursue uh, whatever it is that you want to pursue, uh, that promise might end up being taken from you. I want everyone here to make it to heaven. I, I want to dance on the streets of gold with, with you all with my glorified knees. I'm telling you what. But I want you to know uh, that you got to get your heart uh, in the right place uh, with God. Uh, otherwise, you may not make it to the streets of gold. Uh, and I'm not here to preach anyone out of heaven or I'm not here to preach anyone into hell. I'm just telling you what the book says, uh, that God has called us uh, to live uh, a certain way. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Brother Crow, can I have five more minutes? Five more minutes. As when I got hurt, you know, the, the worst part about it wasn't being hurt. Like the, the worst, you know, like, you know, you just you just kind of learn you can suck it up sometimes. You know, I mean, it's I'm here and, 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 and you know, there's there's a whole story behind it on, on what God was doing. You know, but the worst part about it was having to literally surrender myself to someone else. You know, I, I, I had my I got hurt on Thursday on Thanksgiving morning. I had my surgery on Friday. And can I be transparent? Is that all right? 
So I had my surgery on Friday morning. And Friday afternoon, I called my pastor, Pastor Connor. I said, hey, pastor, this happened. I know that you know. Um, you know, and I, I, felt, I felt awful. I said, can you call Brother Crow? I'm supposed to preach there on Sunday morning. Um, and I, I, I can't, you know. <laughs> I was stuck in this hospital. He's like, oh, don't worry. I already took care of it, you know. And, and so got off the phone with the pastor. Um, and I talked to my wife again for a little bit. And then, you know, after that, I was laying in my bed. And I said, I said, God, I can't do this. Like, I can't be laid up here for unable to use my legs for, for six to eight months. I got a baby on the way. We just moved into a new house. We just bought our first house, you know. And so so I'm here and, and I, I get, I sit up in my bed and I had a hospital bed. It had, there were these alarms on the front of my door and I had a pressure bed. And so if, if less than 10% of my weight was not on the bed, these alarms would sound and lights are flashing. And so, so I said, God, I'm going to scooch over to the edge of my bed. I've prayed for someone in a wheelchair and they've stood up. And I told God this. I said, God, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to testify about this on church on Sunday. I'm going to go back to work on Monday. I can't do this. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, if you get out of this bed, you're going to fall on the floor. As clear as I've ever heard it. And you're going to be in worse shape. And he said a scripture to me, and my Bible was, was at home because my wife hadn't brought all my stuff because, you know, the COVID protocols. And, and so I opened my phone and I went to the scripture and it said, stand still and see the deliverance of the Lord. So, so all my finances, right, I, I, I literally just had to sit there and just watch God work. You know, we had, we had three months worth of our bills and our savings. That was it. And I wasn't going to be able to work for six to eight months, you know. So that's. That's some faith right there. And I'm going to tell you what, for four months, watch this, for four months, someone called, a family member called, they said, they're not in church. They said, we want to pay their mortgage, but we don't want to send them the money because they're going to pay tithes on it. So I was like, all right, here's my account number. You can pay the mortgage. I'll just pay 10% out of my own account. And for four months, I paid 10% of my mortgage out of my own account that paid my mortgage. The Lord, the Lord completely, completely took care of me. And then, and, and, but, but it's hard, you know, we talk about faith, but it's hard trusting God when you're in the situation. And so, so then we, we got the whole God thing situated and, and I'm, an, I'm an independent person. Like if something needs to get done, I just want to do it. But I'm bound to a wheelchair and my legs the whole time, they're just like this. They have to be straight the whole time. And so like as an independent person, it is hard when you have to call someone for everything. Like, hey, I'm hungry. Hey, I want to get from the bed to the wheelchair. Hey, I want to get from the wheelchair to the couch. Hey, I, I want to, I'm getting some cabin fever. Like, can you roll me around just down the street and come back? You know, like that, that was what, and, and it was, it was frustrating to me. Like, it was the most frustrating thing that I had to deal with. And, and the reason it was so hard was because, man, Brother Crow, my wife and I were in a service last summer and, you know, the Lord, so the preacher, the Lord spoke to us through the preacher. He came and he spoke specifically to me and my wife. Oh, God's about to do this thing in your life. Oh, man, we're going to the next level. And then our pastor came up a few minutes later, prayed for us. We're going to the next level. And then a few months later, man, we're in a wheelchair for six months. And I'm here to tell you that in that time, and, and I said all this to say because we, we go through these storms in our life, right? And a lot of the times, these storms in our life that God is using to bring us closer to him, to bring us closer to the promise, we allow it to divert our attention. And so God put that word on me for somebody right now is because you're in the storm. And you're looking at everything else. You're looking at the finances. You're looking at the bills. You're looking at how we're going to get this done. Am I going to have to get a second job? Am I going to have to do this? Well, the word of the Lord for you today is not to take your heart off the Lord and your faith off the Lord, but keep moving towards the Lord. Do not let your heart be taken away from trusting in God to trusting in this world and to men. Because it will lead you to destruction.